Before we start the episode, just want to say if you go to popularfront.shop, you will see that we've started a mutual aid coronavirus raffle to basically help the homeless because there's very few provisions for the homeless. And these are times when people like that really need looking after, I think. So we've started this raffle. 100% of the money will go to three charities, three homeless charities. If you go to popularfront.shop, you'll see the raffle thing there. You can enter for five pounds. You'll see the charities it's going to. And you'll see all of the stuff you can win if your name is drawn out the hat after a month of this raffle going on. Already we've raised over £2,000, so thank you very much. But yeah, go to popularfront.shop. You'll see the raffle there. This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to journalist Joachim Medin. He's going to be telling us about how the leader of Hungary, Orban, has managed to basically turn the country into a dictatorship using the excuse of the coronavirus. Now, he already had a state of emergency in place due to immigration. He's kind of used this as a step forward with all of that authoritarian stuff. So, yeah, Joachim is going to explain to us how exactly he managed to get to this point and how the EU basically can't really do anything about it. It's a very bad situation. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, please do consider supporting us on the Patreon. It's the only way we keep moving. Patreon.com slash Popular Front. Okay, mate. Um... So, first of all, can you explain what has happened in Hungary? What was it like last month? People are saying it's basically become a dictatorship. Like, what is going on? Uh, right now, by the end of uh, of, of March, they um, uh, already actually in March, they, they announced this state of emergency due to the, um, uh, the pandemic. So, uh, uh, they decided that we need um, we need to prolong uh, this state of emergency and we want to do this we want to, we want to ensure that it's possible to prolong it by giving prime minister viktor orban uh, the possibility to rule by decree uh, now the way they reason is that uh, you've also had this these initiatives in in several other european countries uh, where, where the prime ministers or presidents to one degree or the other has to be getting this possibility to rule by decree, um, ma- not making it necess- necessary to wait for um, comments or acceptance by, by the parliament. So this also happened in Hungary. The difference is that there's, uh, there's no sunset clause, there's no deadline to this, uh, uh, to this decree, rule of decree in, in Hungary. So what powers does uh, Orban have now? Well, basically, uh, he has the possibility to rule uh, uh, and to, to put the ex- existing laws uh, and legislation to the side and to create his own rules and laws without waiting for approval by the parliament. The, ex- the activities of the parliament are basically frozen. Furthermore, um, uh, if you as a person uh publish information that is seen to be to, to be untrue or, or to be fake news or whatever according to the government or uh, is information that can that can quote uh, agitate the masses you can um, uh, get punished um, uh, you can just get sent to prison to up to five years actually wow okay so He's basically that. I mean, that is effectively a dictatorship. I think under anybody's kind of guidelines. How did this happen? Because I know I was reading a little bit about it, and it said that the parliament approved this. Like, how does that? How did it get to this stage? Well, they, the parliament did indeed improve this, and that's the only reason for that is because uh, since the the spring of two thousand ten, for the past decade, uh, Prime Minister Orbán's party. We got the governmental party Fides, they've had an absolute two-thirds majority in the parliament. That's why they've been able to, to push through hundreds of laws attacking the, the democratic fun- functions, the democratic system in Hungary, uh, without uh, really, they don't really have to care about what, you know, what all the other parties are saying about it. 
Uh, it's the same thing in, in Poland, uh, where the governmental party has a two-thirds majority and they've been able to implement a very authoritarian agenda and the rest of the parties can do nothing about it. So, hence, yes, they do have the approval of a majority in the parliament, but that's because they control the majority of the, of the parliament. It sounds very nice when they explain it that way, but it's just very simple, actually. So, basically, he was just kind of asking permission from the people that already agree with him. Yeah, from his for him MPs, and uh, and obviously they are all controlled by by the party leader, who is Mr. Orban himself. I mean, was there anyone saying no? We can't do this. This is outrageous. The country is going to become a dictatorship. Surely there was some kind of you know dissent or, or pushback against this. Yeah, every every other party uh, pro protested apart apart from a few individual MPs who. Um, who uh, are the either independent or have been, according to some people, bought over to Orbán's side. Uh, all of the other parties and party groups, they all uh, desperately protested against this, but just like before, it didn't matter at all. So this was pushed through in the parliament. Right, so how did Orbán manage to get this level of power in Hungary? Maybe you can kind of take us back to the start of his, you know, rise to power. Where is, like, where did he come from? Where is, where is all this you know, power coming from. Right, so Orban has been uh, one of the main politicians and, and political profiles um, in Hungary as, as a leader of the Fidesz party since um, the tr transition to democracy 30 years ago. So uh, uh, he used to be the prime minister also between 1998 and 2002, um, by which point he was a nationalist-minded, uh, but still kind of, I mean, populist, but still democratic uh, prime minister. Now, uh, he became sort of the main figure of the opposition against the left liberal government of 2006 to 2010. Uh, and he won the, 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 the elections in the spring of 2010, in April 2010, 10 years ago. Uh, after he won, he immediately announced uh, a complete uh, restructuring of the political system in, in Hungary, and this had not been announced uh, as part of his election campaign uh, before that moment. So it came as a complete surprise to everyone uh, following Hungary, and even the people voted voted for him. So what, what did he say when he was running? Like, what, why did, what did people vote for? He was making a lot of uh, uh, populist... Um, uh, promises, but also some promises related to to sort of improving the welfare sector and uh, and helping uh, helping the the true people, like ordinary people. And he's been as a populist leader, he's been claiming for years to to represent ordinary people. And he's not part of the elite at all. Has been his his saying, even though he's he's the member. Uh, he, he is, he's the MP who stayed the longest in the Hungarian parliament. He still claims to be a member of the, of, you know, the community of ordinary Hungarians. But he's a career politician. Yeah, very much so. I mean, he's been member of parliament for 30 years. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's his background? How did he get into politics? Uh, he, was, uh, he was at uni uh, by the late 80s. Uh, he was studying law and... Uh, he and um, a couple of others, um, young Hungarians, liberal-minded Hungarians, um, they co-founded uh, the Fidesz uh, Youth Movement, which by 1990 became the Fidesz Party. And it was a liberal party. Uh, and didn't, it didn't do very well in the elections in the first years. So uh, in the mid-90s, Orban decided uh, very rapidly to transform it into a right-wing, nationalist, kind of Christian democratic oriented party. So this caused a split uh, with a lot of liberals leaving the party and these people I've interviewed, they are still liberals today. But the people who stayed with Orban, they, they've been remaining loyal and right-wing and nationalist minded. And um, this has very much been the, um, the story of, of Orban's political career. He's a, he's a pragmatic politician uh, yearning for, for political power and, and a, a possibility to influence and, and rule. So uh, uh, from the mid-90s to, to 2014, 
15, we can say, it was just an ordinary right-wing turn of uh, authoritarian party. Uh, when, the, when the refugee crisis appeared in 2015, it also became fiercely anti-migration, uh, anti-Muslim, xenophobic, racist. Uh, so it turned, according to a lot of people, uh, it turned even very far right and, and towards, I mean, racist policies. Right, maybe you can give us a, like some examples of that because often people do try to, you know, everything is far right these days. Every, everything, you know, if, if you say, well, yeah, I mean, I don't think that, you know, we should just let everyone into the country. People will go, that's far right. You know what I mean? So maybe you can give us some examples of what Orban has actually been saying because this guy, as far as I understand, is genuinely like actually a far right authoritarian guy. But maybe you can give us some examples of why that is. Right, so uh, the Hungarian government has been claiming and is indeed still claiming that um, the uh, uh, the arrival of migrants and asylum-seeking refugees to Europe is not um, sort of a, a natural occurrence due to due to wars and uh, and, in, and and global poverty, etc. It's it's uh, somehow a scheme organized by one single individual. Um, the very old, Soros? yeah, the very old philanthropist <laughs> George Soros, um, who is uh, Hungarian by birth, um, uh, but now also a U.S. citizen. So they've been claiming for the past, for, well, basically since um, the end of 2015 that he's somehow been been organizing all of this, and they've used that as an excuse to attack. Um, uh, to attack uh, NGOs working both to, to, to promote the respect of democracy and, and human rights, investigating the government for, for, for abuse, but also uh, protecting asylum seekers' rights. They've, they've used this to clamp down on NGOs. Um, they also used this to attack and eventually actually dra drive out the... Um, uh, the private university CEU, the Central European University, from Budapest. Uh, it re relocated last year to uh, Vienna instead. It was forced to, due to a law that singled out the CEU and kept it from from continuing to exist in Hungary. Uh, so this, uh, they, they also made this, this extremely, I mean... Um, uh, a conspiracy minded uh, the, the spreading these conspiracy theories about how there's this uh, hidden agenda scheme by Brussels and by Soros and by by liberals and, and left wing politicians it's also a big conspiracy uh, and it doesn't help that Soros is is, uh, is Jewish obviously so there's, 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 there's a lot of these examples, and um, and what's interesting is that um, uh, what's been the biggest opposition party for years in Hungary, which is the far-right party Jobbik, uh, who is originally an um, uh, anti-Roma, uh, anti-Semitic, um, homophobic, even anti-democratic party, they've been sort of going towards... Um, uh, the center of, of, of the political landscape, while Orban has been pushing his party more and more to the right to attract the people that Jobbik uh, have lost. Okay, so he's trying to get old Jobbik supporters. Now, I, I did some research on Jobbik years ago. I mean, they're openly fascist. They even had what can kind of be described as like a street militia, right? Yeah, but this this was a couple of years ago. So so it, it is it is very important to mention that they've they've changed, and uh, they've seen um, a lot of a lot of politicians and voters leaving their party because of the change. Um, they've had splits uh, just just uh, uh, a month or two ago. There was a very dramatic split where a couple of MPs left the parliament and uh, the party. And I mean, last winter when there were these very large um, a protests appearing all over Hungary. I saw uh, supporters and politicians of Jobbik protest side by side with left with, with, with left liberal people, with other opposition Peter, uh, parties, even with the uh, Hungarian Jews. Uh, 
Wow, that's a big change. So would you say then that Orban's government is more far right or more right wing than Jobbik was or is now? I wouldn't say that the government is, is more far right than Jobbik used to be, but uh, definitely um, I would say, and I, and I wrote and I was interviewing people who said that, that two years ago when I published my book about Hungary, these two parties were sort of representing the same values and the same ideas. But by now, things have kept going so far that, that I wouldn't say it's outrageous to claim that the Orban gov- a party and government is, is more far right than Jobbik, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those protests last year? What were they about? Yeah, so these were protests that appeared uh, uh, visibly, out of, I mean, out of nowhere, really, uh, in December of 2018. Uh, they appeared because of, uh, well, from one part, well, people being generally frustrated for a long time, but also because um, uh, there was a new law pushed through in the parliament by the uh, government that uh, attacked um, uh, labor rights in Hungary. So a few, um, a few trade unions wait, went out to protest, and this, this caused, I mean... Uh, uh, more people to join them basically to to um to voice their 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 protest and and their frustration so suddenly these became the largest protests uh, to date to to appear against the orban government where initially you saw also a lot of violence both from the police and from certain protesters right and how big did they get they got they got very big i mean they they were the biggest uh, uh i mean ongoing pro i mean they kept going for weeks and months even uh, tens of thousands of people um in the in the capital budapest and also in the larger cities and also in uh, in a few smaller cities as well and why did they you know i know there were some clashes as well but why did they stop i guess did they get what they wanted or no no i mean as 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 happens in so many countries eventually i mean uh, <laughs> People lose their momentum, people get tired. This was in the middle of the winter, so by February when they died out, it was it was pretty damn cold also. Uh, I also I, I was I was also there reporting about it and people were tear gassed uh, at some occasions and uh, it's just a very I mean, yeah, it's very difficult obviously to sustain a protest movement in the streets in the middle of the winter. Yeah, no, of course, especially in that part of the world. But that does tell us that there are tens of thousands of people potentially willing to protest against Auburn now, do you think? Or do you think that's not possible? I don't mean this minute, because obviously coronavirus is serious. But like you said, he hasn't said when this will stop. And I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say, judging on what he's been doing in the past, he's probably going to keep these powers going for a lot longer than the coronavirus is around. No, right. And I, I, I think it's very important to stress that uh, Hungary is, uh, is a very, very polarized country. Uh, indeed, uh, as many countries are in Europe, between certain people who, who support uh, a right-wing nationalist uh, approach and, and, let's say, a liberal, left-liberal bubble who supports something else. There's these different polarized bubbles in society. Uh, Hungary is the same. I mean, roughly half of the of the voter of the voters support uh, Orbán's party. The other half does not. But because of the um, of the uh, 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 the rules and the, the election system, which uh, Orbán's party designed itself, uh, even if you only get slightly above fifty percent of the votes, you get a two-thirds majority in the parliament, and this is how they they kept this two-thirds absolute majority in the parliament. So, uh, uh, despite this, uh, about uh, slightly less than half of of uh, all voters in Hungary are actually against the government, and it's very important not to forget this. Right, and do you think they'll come out onto the streets to uh, to protest? Do you think they'll be able to now that he has all these powers? That would only be possible, obviously, uh, uh, when the when 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 the Corona pandemic has, has passed to one degree or another, and it's it's possible by law to have large masses of people together again. Uh, and the trick with this, I mean, I think what's very important to understand here is that that these measures to rule by decree to get all of these extra powers, 
would would perhaps be uh, slightly worrying in any country to give the government and its its leader this kind of power. Why it's why it's much more worrying in the Hungarian case is because of the systematic attacks against uh, the democratic system and functions in the last decade in Hungary. It makes it so much more worrying. Um, and uh, uh, also due to the fact that there's no sunset clause on this, it means that, that it is, it's up to Orban and the government themselves to decide when the corona crisis is over. And they can just keep prolonging this crisis and hence keep these powers. So uh, imagine, yes, uh, uh, if, if the World Health Organization and, and, and the EU announces that, yeah, there's no more uh, corona crisis and people, people walk out in the streets to protest in Hungary against the government, the government can, can issue a new law saying that, yeah, we, we still consider this to be a crisis and we, uh, from this moment, forbid all demonstrations. Wow, yeah, and and as long as there's one person in um, in Hungary with Corona, they can say, "Well, it's not over." I feel like this coronavirus has just been an absolute gift to him. Do you know what I mean? It's like he was waiting for something like this, and it's just fallen into his lap. It's an excuse. You know what I mean? Right, and I mean, uh, obviously, he's. Uh... I mean, I've been writing uh, several articles about this in the last in the last days and, and weeks now, and. Uh... And obviously, this is what a lot of people criticizing him are saying. Uh, when I've been speaking to people in Hungary, they say that uh, the thing is that that you still to this, you still today have a state of emergency due to what the government calls calls a mass migration crisis. Ever since the fall of 2015, there's been a state of emergency. Uh, due to the phenomena of mass migration, it, it keeps getting prolonged every six months in Hungary, ever since 2015. And this has enabled the government to take extraordinary actions. Um, and this is despite the fact that there are no, almost no migrants and asylum seekers in Hungary. Uh, they, they, they still they, they keep claiming this and they keep, for this reason, prolonging the state of emergency. And... Obviously, people are scared that they can they can keep doing the same with with this with this thing. A state of emergency because of immigration. That's mad. What kind of powers does he have under this state of emergency? The immigration one. This is mainly uh, this has mainly been manifested by the border to Serbia. They they constructed what is still today the longest uh, border wall in in Europe. It's a it's a double fence a, a double fence. Uh, it's also partly uh, uh, electrified, uh, running uh, across the entire Hungarian-Serbian border. Uh, any migrant, refugee, whosoever who wishes to claim as an asylum, um, one person per day are allowed to cross the border and enter um, a border area where they are uh, forcibly locked into um, uh, camps. Uh, and this is against uh, international uh, asylum law, um, and and you also have a couple of other measures. The, the uh, I myself was uh, uh, detained and uh, and illegally uh, interrogated twice by the same border in 2017. For what? For just reporting on the situation. Well, they claim that no civilians could be in the border area, uh, and they detained me, and they. Um, uh, interrogated me twice uh, at the site, not at the police station, so to not leave a paper trail. And while they claim this, that this is a no-go area for civilians, two Hungarian civilians uh, passed me in tracksuits. Uh, they were out, I mean, just running and, and they just said good afternoon. Clearly they're just trying to clamp down on the press. Right, yeah. Um, and what what is the EU doing about all of this? Because the EU is always, you know, saying that they care about democracy and liberty. But certainly, in my opinion anyway, I think, you know, the EU is actually very quite corrupted in many ways and doesn't actually do that much outside of its own trade deals. What Have they have they said anything to Hungary? Like, the fact that they've even let it get, get to this level makes me think they probably should have done something already. I mean, now he's basically just made himself a dictator. I mean, what are they saying about this? Surely they can't have it. Well, uh, the thing is that ever since he started um, uh, 
uh, clamping down on, on, on democratic principles and, and functions in Hungary. Uh, as soon as he uh, came to power before the summer of 2010, uh, he has been criticized by um, by the EU Parliament, by by different uh, EU institutions, and and uh, by by a lot of supranational uh, bodies, experts, other governments, embassies, etc., human rights organizations. Uh, uh, <laughs> He has been criticized by the EU. The problem is that it, a fundamental um, problem with the EU is that you do have, as, as, as a state that wishes to enter the EU, you have to, um, you have to, to somehow prove that you, you've been able to, uh, to climb this enormous mountain of obstacles. We, we have to, you have to prove that you are a democracy by a lot of different standards and criteria. Uh, to be able to become an, uh, a member state of the EU. But once you are a member state, in, in reality, the European Union doesn't really have a lot of tools to use if a member state starts to backtrack on democracy. Now, if a, if a member state starts to, uh, to leave democratic principles, this, this, in reality, there's only uh, just very few tools they can use um, apart from, from protesting. And this has been the case with, with Hungary, and Hungary was the first country where a, a right-wing authoritarian party came to power on itself with the political power to implement its agenda. This is the first time it happened in Hungary, uh, and the EU has been unable to intervene, opening up for more parties to follow in Orbán's footsteps, and this has now been the case for the past four and a half years in Poland. Yeah, well, that makes me think, okay, the EU have criticised him, but action-wise have done nothing. But if they can't do anything, I kind of think, what's the point then? Like, why make someone jump through these hoops to join if then they can just renege on it and then just go, right, we're not doing that anymore, and then they're still in the EU? Do you know what I mean? It just seems mad to me. I don't know. But um, let's say then the complete it's very like it's not going to happen but imagine the eu said to hungary right you're kicked out the eu who are their allies uh, right now outside of the eu countries or, or at least the the eu itself in the case of hungary the biggest ally outside of the eu is uh, is russia um after ah. after russia there's there's a number of states where they also been been um uh promoting a very friendly agenda uh, for example turkey uh, china uh, the us uh, at least since orban got to meet with president trump which which actually took a while um so but but i still can't really see a future where, where orban would like to leave the eu uh because of the fact that uh, uh his closest political ally, uh, Putin, the way he sees it is that Orban can can create more havoc and and destruction as as a member of the EU instead of being outside of the EU. Also, Hungary is very much dependent on um, on uh, on the money that the that they and other, especially in in Central Eastern Europe, that they get from the EU. Uh, and this money has uh, has to a very large degree been ending up in uh, in the pockets of um, of uh, industrialists, uh, companies, and stooges of uh, of Orban. Wow! So so he's he's just made Hungary a dictatorship. Effectively, he's pilfering away EU money. He's he's going against the rules of the EU, and basically, there's nothing anyone can do. Well, there there is there is uh, uh, there's a pro a process called the Article Seven process. This is something that that um, uh, the EU activated about uh, a year and a half ago now, and this is a, a process in the EU where they evaluate whether Hungary, as a member state, due to its government and its practice, has been breaking. Uh, the fundamental democratic values of the European Union. This is also this is a similar process against Poland and its government at this moment. Um, 
Uh, the, the consequences cannot really be that you're kicked out of the union, but the consequences can be that you are sanctioned. For example, that you you lose part of your uh, of the money you get from the EU, from the wealthier states. You uh, you get your you lose your voting right, for example. And these these sanctions can, in theory, be, be implemented, uh, but it never happened before. Uh, Hungary is the first case where we've actually seen this process, act, process activated um, and it's very hard to say whether this initiative by the EU can result in something uh, well very concrete and fundamental when everything else really hasn't. Wow man, um, yeah it's a worry. Um... I mean, it's a, it's a very, very like highly unlikely, I know. But in your opinion, you know, you've written a book about Orban. You understand Hungary very well. Is there any chance of the people rebelling, like rising up to try and topple him? I mean, whether that be via protest or something harder. I mean, what do you think? It's very hard to say because on the one hand, uh, these protests, as I mentioned, uh, the protests of, um, of the winter uh, 2018-2019, they came... Uh, out of nowhere, really, they, they took everyone by surprise. So that that still manifested, you know, that there is still uh, a lot of anger that can explode on the streets. Um, on the other hand, uh, one of the best quotes that I ever got in in Hungary, and this was already several years ago, was by an opposition politician, and he said the great danger with with, with Hungary and Orban, the Hungarian government and Orban, is that. He's created sort of a, a handbook on how to dismantle democracy in a smooth way, in a way that you don't really get these uprisings uh, on the streets. It's, it's done in a very smooth way that you can you can point out enemies, you can point out a crisis situation as of 2015 or as of now to justify your your policies and and this sort of um, creates this this political apathy among uh, uh, the opposition as well as voters um, not supporting Orban. Yeah, this is that's very true in terms of, I think, how, you know, the allies, the far-right allies that Orban has as well, you can see that they're trying to, it's like this, I don't know, yeah, it's like you said, like a, a degradation, right? Like just slowly grinding it down. It's not like Hitler coming in and taking over. It's slowly, slowly grinding it down until you know when you think oh it's time to resist it's too late exactly it is it is very i mean to some degrees it is very similar to to what's been happening in turkey which i know is a country you also know um uh, i mean tur turkey you, you do you do still have elections in turkey you, you still have these sort of a facade of of uh, of uh, democratic um uh functions but in theory it's all this is all just in theory in in reality it is an authoritarian system and government and the same thing Absolutely. has the thing, same thing has been happening in hungary people aren't really in prison people aren't killed there's no there's no uh, civil war going on but but uh, there is there is this sort of uh, i mean a, a climate of uh, a climate of, of fear spreading. Uh, there is um, uh, self censorship going on for years. Uh, you have this this political development, um, uh, which is sort of uh, yeah, undermining democracy while they can still claim that we are having democratic elections, etc. Yeah, man, it's really not looking good. Where can people follow your work? You know, Twitter or wherever it is you want to, you know, direct people to. I mostly publish. Uh, I've had some re really bad experiences on uh, on Twitter. So I um, being attacked by by uh, government controlled media outlets of Hungary, for example, on Twitter. So I'm not really on there anymore. But uh, you can follow my work on Facebook. That's the, the easiest way. J O A K I M. M-E-D-I-N Okay mate, brilliant. Thank you so much mate. Thank you very much. That was Joachim Medin speaking about how Hungary is basically being turned into a dictatorship thanks to, well, ostensibly because of coronavirus, but actually because Orban just is an authoritarian uh, mad one, bad situation. 
definitely something we'll keep an eye on. Um, if you like what we're doing, please do consider supporting us if you can at patreon.com slash popular front. Um, this episode is sponsored by the defensepost.com. Defense with an S. Go there for regular updates on the world in conflict. Also, it's sponsored by Oracle Coffee Shop in Portland, Oregon, USA. They're an independent coffee shop selling only fair trade products. Go and see them at 3875 Southwest, Bond Avenue, 97239. Tell them Popular Front sent you. Obviously, you can't go right now because coronavirus is closed. Um, but we continue to, you know, have this uh, cooperation with them because they're treating their staff well. They're not fucking everybody off. Good people. When all this is over, definitely go and have coffee there. Uh, this is also sponsored by Black Triangle, an independent company manufacturing their own low-key self-defense tools. Good bunch of people. Uh, check them out on Instagram at Black Triangle Group or buy their stuff from their website at blktriangle.com. Tell them Popular Front sent you. You might get a discount or some goodies. I don't know. Um, please follow us on Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash popular. F- no, shut up. What am I talking about? Instagram.com slash popular dot front. YouTube is uh, youtube.com slash popular front. The Twitter, mine is Jake underscore Hanrahan. I forgot then. H A N R A H A N or the popular front one, uh, popular front CO. If you go to popularfront.tv, there's a playlist, a big playlist of um, war and conflict documentaries that we've put together because obviously you're probably bored as fuck on lockdown unless you're in Sweden and you're just fucking around basically. But um, yeah, like if, you, if you're in most places, you're on lockdown with coronavirus. So yeah, there's some good docs on there. Have a watch. We put it all together. Um, you know, just there you go. Popularfront.tv, you'll find it. It's a YouTube playlist embedded within the site. So you can bring it up on, um, on your telly or whatever. Uh, thank you very much to the following uh, Patreons. Uh, Adam Bergsnyder, Amy Rupert, Andrew Hurley, Axel Iverson, Azad, Bill Wilson, Brian McLaughlin, uh, Trey Nance, Chad Walker, Charlie, Chris, Christina Rovetti, Christopher Martin, DR, Dan Dunham, Daniel Shearer, Diana Gorvanek, Emiliano, Emily Molly, Fletcher Tate, Frank Austin, Greg H, James from the Discord, uh, he steals memes, so be careful if you're in the Discord, Janet Basurto, Joanne Stocker, Josh, Jungle King Virapan, K. Hardy Roberts, Lawrence Abrahams, Liam Williams, Williams, sorry, Michael, Michael Brocchetti, Moritz Zumbawal, Moody Al Rashid, Ari, Olin Thorne, Patrick Bronte, Peter McCormick from What Bitcoin Did, uh, Kubel, Rubicon, Ryan Sandercock, Scartoon Music, Sebastian from the Discord, Surushe Hawazi, Stephen Davila, Tony Bin, and Vida Provost. Thank you all very much. Like I always say, without you, this would not keep going. If you want to support us and you want uh, bonus episodes, access to the Discord, all sorts of stuff, go to patreon.com slash popular front. Or if you want to support us a different way, go to popularfront.co slash support. This is all grassroots. This is how we survive. Also the merch, uh, popularfront.shop. We've got loads of cool t-shirts, all sorts of stuff there. Hoodies, um, patches. I think there's some patches left. I don't know. Posters, everything. Popularfront.shop. Go there. Um, Yeah, music in this episode. The intro was by Home. And the outro was by Sam Black. Find his music at samblackpf.com.